Good evening, and welcome to Tom Talk Goes Straight to DVD. Hello, my name is Tom Tuck, which is a brilliant name to have when your schoolmates are amateur poets. Um, <laughs> in this show, I'm attempting to shine a light on a different dark corner of show business and try and find out why on earth it exists. This week, an almost exclusively American genre. Episode two, the strangely lucrative and technically incompetent Christian propaganda of faith films. <laughs> Faith Films is a subdivision of a much larger company. Um, I'm presuming that any film nerds in the room might have heard of them. They're called The Asylum. If you haven't, I'll enlighten you. Set up in 1997 by David Michael Latt, they specialise in low-budget, straight-to-DVD schlock. Real rubbish. And it wasn't until 2005 they really struck gold, because that was when they decided to make a film version of War of the Worlds and release it suspiciously close to when Spielberg released his. And they made loads more money than they had ever made before. From then on, they boast, no asylum film has ever lost money. And a few have made significantly more than their admittedly piddly budgets. <laughs> Once they hit upon the formula, they started cranking them out. Transmorphers, The Terminators, Paranormal Entity, Almighty Thor, Snakes on a Train. <laughs> they are the undeniable kings of the mockbuster, as it is known. They've even managed to make their own version of what is a fairly low-rent movie to begin with, Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. <laughs> their version? Abraham Lincoln versus zombies, of course. <laughs> I found out that this little subsection of films was branded faith films. Presumably these two were profitable ventures, because I can't imagine the producer of Mega Shark versus Giant Octopus does anything for charity. <laughs> and the first movie released under this label is called The Apocalypse. Ooh. Yeah, sounds pretty exciting. You might watch that. Now, the subdivision is specifically set up to release religious films. It's important to note that these aren't Bible stories. In fact, it's arguable that they're barely stories at all. <laughs> These little demi-stories where the answer is God. <laughs> the Apocalypse is written by David Michael Latt, the founder of the company, who also produces the film himself. His wife, Kim, takes a small role, as do a number of asylum regulars. Rhett Giles plays the lead. He's an Australian actor who battles gamely against his own accent. <laughs> and, and indeed acting in general. Um, he, he does his very best, but I don't think they give him enough takes to get it right. <laughs> his IMDB entry is glorious. Mainly because one must assume that he's written it himself. I quote, Only two actors have played characters named Van Helsing in more than one film <laughs> related to the Dracula legend. Now, that's a lot of caveats. <laughs> Those actors are Rhett Giles and Peter Cushing. Oh, that is the most desperate grasp for a straw I have ever seen. <laughs> How desperate does your CV have to be to put something like that on it? Imagine doing that for any other job in the world. Only two admin assistants have used a photocopier in more than four offices in London. One of them is now Prime Minister. Minister and the other is Rhett Giles. It's not gonna help. <laughs> He's joined in this film by a woman called Kristen Quintral, which sounds like a drunk person trying to say Kim Cattrall. And her face looks exactly how you'd imagine that description to be. <laughs> it's directed by a man called Justin Jones. Uh, he's the helmer of the soon-to-be-released and surely classic-in-waiting Sorority Party Massacre. <laughs> But he's also directed another film with a similar title, Quantum Apocalypse, <laughs> which is also released by The Asylum, but not under Faith Films, and it stars the same two actors. <laughs> the film opens with a bunch of losers camping, the kind of people that you're pretty certain are going to die really soon, because it's the beginning of the film, and they've got really vague personalities, and they're camping. <laughs> They have some inconsequential chat, and then one of them gets up to go for a wee in the forest. And then he is immediately hit in the chest by a meteor. <laughs> Just meteor in the chest, first thing in your film. Yep, yep, meteor in the chest. Why not? Because you haven't got the special effects budget for it, love. 
Then we cut to people who are supposed to care a lot more about because they've got better jaw lines. <laughs> and those people are watching the news. Oh no, 10,000 people dead, that's sad. <laughs> and our next guest is Dr. Scientist. I can't remember what he's actually called in the film, but I remember what they said next. Dr. Scientist, who won the Nobel Prize for Physics and Chemistry. What? We can't do, but it's not Physics and Chemistry. Then I looked it up, and apparently that's what the name of the Nobel Prize is. It is Physics and Chemistry. One nil to Faith Films. <laughs> so they have done some research, but the, the overwhelming sensation when you watch it these is, is to doubt everything they've put on the screen, is to question every decision they've made. Why are you doing that? At one point, Rhett and Kristen step outside their home, they hear something and they go, landslide. Because that's the first thing you do when you hear a small noise. But it is a landslide. Really badly done. And there aren't any mountains or even large hills near them. So they get in the car and they drive away really fast and the landslide doesn't follow them, because that's not how landslides work. <laughs> and then they're just on the road driving really fast from something that isn't chasing them. And that's a car chase with one car. <laughs> And if there's anything I know about car chases, it's the more the merrier. <laughs> you can't have a chase with one. That's just going. <laughs> They're trying to go and get their daughter, who's in L.A. She and her boyfriend decide to try and protect themselves from the cyclone that hits. Yep, it's pretty relentless <laughs> and pretty unconvincing. <laughs> uh, by getting into the bathtub. What? The bathtub? Yeah, get under a table. The bathtub? When is that a thing? They die. Well, he does. <laughs> There's so much so preposterously awful about this film. Well, the sound editing really deserves particular mention. <laughs> There's only one mildly well-acted uh, scene in the entire film. It's when they're ambushed by a guy who looks a bit like how Omid Jalili looks to all Hollywood casting directors. <laughs> uh, and you can't hear half of the dialogue because they stick loads of helicopter noises over the top. So he's saying something and only one doing a good job. <laughs> of the lines I did here throughout the course of the film, I would like to present to you my favourites. Now, as a sort of audio collage of nonsense. <laughs> Imagine that you're just like overhearing them on a bus. In incidentally, best thing I've ever, ever heard on a bus. Um, no. 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 No, I've just had a minor operation. <laughs> no. No. No, I'll get some chips. <laughs> so just listen to these beauties. This is my deepest, darkest secret. What? You're a Jesus freak? What about all your tattoos and piercings and stuff? Stuff? What stuff? You never find out. <laughs> the president's gonna speak. Do you think he'll mention the end of the world? I hope so. Why? This is just so biblical. <laughs> and it all ends up being about the rapture. You know, the rapture, the idea that the faithful will be transported to heaven before the end of the world. And this idea, this, this concept of the chosen few, the chosen tribe, it's just so American, isn't it? That's why they have so many nutters over there. It's because we were intolerant of this sort of nonsense in the 17th century. <laughs> now, I, I was looking, doing some background reading about the film and looking up, and I found my favourite thing about it. It's an online review from a man who was so furious <laughs> about this film that he totally lost control of his grasp of the English language. <laughs> I mean, maybe he wasn't perfect at it to begin with, but you can really feel the rage permeating. I'll read it in the calmest voice I can muster and see if you can feel the bile. <laughs> if you didn't see this movie, you know what is worst movie ever published to humanity. <laughs> Every word for this masterpiece is too good, too light. Even those words I have in my mind right now, and those words are heavy. <laughs> If I write here, internet probably will crush. <laughs> Only nice thing in this movie is his end. <laughs> it's difficult to argue with him. <laughs> now, I was brought up Catholic. 
Well, sort of. My mum is. My dad's a member of the church of I really don't give a toss, can I play golf? <laughs> so every Sunday, me and my brothers would put on our finest, nearly matching Hawaiian shirts. <laughs> and mum and my sister would put on dresses and off we'd go to the Banani Catholic Church in Dhaka. Just off road 18. Very few roads in Dhaka get names. <laughs> Dad would put on his finest shorts and play a round of golf. My mum had me at university. She was at a Catholic college in Leeds studying psychology, specialising in the language development of infants. So she thought to herself, I better get one. <laughs> so she did, and out I popped, and then she studied my linguistic progress intently. It's a wonder I've grown up convinced of the importance of everything I say, isn't it? <laughs> it was recorded till I was three. No, I don't believe in God at all. And I never really did. I had no great anti-Damascene conversion. I just never thought I was supposed to take it literally. And I enjoyed having quiet time in church. Incense is nice. The Catholics can put together a natty outfit. Plus you get a bit of wine. How British. I think my definition of Britishness is slightly different to everybody else's. I think basically, if you can sit down and have a pint with me quietly, then you're British. I don't care where your parents' genitals met. I once met this Lithuanian bloke in a now sadly defunct pub. And I think the only word he knew in English was Foster's. And we got on like a house on fire. I think we were talking about the European Union, but you can't be too sure in the circumstances. I much prefer interactions like that than chats with people from, I don't know, Northampton who go, oh, I don't really like drinking. <laughs> I don't like what it does to me. <laughs> what, what it does to you? Does it make you leave? Because <laughs> if so, I am buying. <laughs> oh, lime and soda, is it? And so I kept going to church, happily, until Mum tried to get me to go through confirmation. And that changed the game. Now, don't get me wrong, of course I wanted a bonus name. <laughs> but then I checked, and there wasn't a St Battlecat. <laughs> so there wasn't really a big enough payoff for me standing up in front of people I didn't know and saying stuff I didn't believe in. And I thought, I've got an idea. If I just tweak this a little, I might get away with it. I can stand up in front of everyone and say, yeah, I reject Santana and all his works. <laughs> <laughs> but Mum would probably have been recording it. <laughs> so we come to the day the earth stopped. <laughs> in which they pull off quite a casting coup, because Judd Nelson's in it. Yeah, yeah, Judd Nelson from off of St Elmo's Fire and Breakfast Club, and that's about it. Well, he's the voice of Hot Rod in the original Transformers. That means he's co-starred with Eric Idle and Orson Welles. You can't take that away from him. But he does have this blot on his CV. It's another load of old guff, and this time it's not about the rapture. No, it's about giant space robots who come down from space and, and stand in all the major cities of the world. And then there's two aliens and they have come down from space to judge humanity. There's some sort of unidentified quasi-military operation who capture the aliens and then interrogate them whilst trying to figure out what the robots are going to do, which means mainly the same shot of people looking at blueprints. How they have blueprints of giant megabots that have just landed on Earth is beyond me. <laughs> now, all that sounds pretty exciting, but the special effects are once again so spectacularly poor that it completely fails in any way to be exciting. The robots look like they're drawn in Microsoft Paint and then just put next to a postcard of a city. <laughs> Even when they kill people, it's boring. So the two aliens look exactly like humans, which must have been gloriously easy on the budget. <laughs> Should we give them... Like, blue skin? No. <laughs> what about, like, wrinkly heads? Mm, no. <laughs> Pointy ears? No. 
I've got to just make them a bit Irishy looking. <laughs> are you like? Are you are you sure? Of course I'm sure. I'm David Michael Latt. <laughs> now the lady alien, who initially they find naked. Costumes are expensive. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure thing, David. Starts being able to read people's thoughts. And then she's talking to one of them, and he thinks something, and she goes, What's church? Oh, shut up! <laughs> she's there to destroy the planet unless someone can prove to her that there is something of value in human life. <laughs> so one of the soldiers breaks her out of the detention facility, and they go on a mission to see if there's anything there to convince her. Is there? Yeah, it's God and b babies and stuff. <laughs> and that seems to satisfy when all the robots fly away. <laughs> well, I say fly, they're sort of lifted out of shot. <laughs> it's nonsense. The next one's Countdown Armageddon, which is also known as Countdown Jerusalem, which is slightly offensive if you think those words are interchangeable. <laughs> I think Jerusalem's got enough problems without you weighing in, David. <laughs> It starts off with a child doing some colouring in with crayons and, and, and her babysitter is watching the news and the news goes, there has been a peace treaty in the Middle East. What, that's it? No further details, just a peace treaty. <laughs> oh yeah, they just sorted it. <laughs> and then the babysitter says, hey look, your mommy's going to be on TV soon and we cut to mommy and she's reporting from outside a temple. And then there's a massive earthquake, by which I mean someone shakes the camera. <laughs> and then there's loads of shoddy CGI. And honestly, you could do a better fire effect if you just held a match near the lens. <laughs> Everything about this film was bad. The kid can't even act asleep. <laughs> Fifteen minutes in, someone says, I feel like there's something bigger going on. Really, let me guess. Is it uh, the rapture? <laughs> Yup. <laughs> the baddies in this seem to be the European Union. We've rebranded themselves, according to the next news broadcast, and I'm not kidding, as the New World Order. I mean, if you were going to be a baddie, you'd pick a better name, wouldn't you? Start to wonder if UKIP's involved. <laughs> and the kid disappears, and Mommy finds an encrypted hard disk. Of course she does. Which the babysitter seems to know what to do with. Why is your babysitter a skilled hacker? <laughs> The babysitter then gets injected in the neck by a Syrian, who turns up. <laughs> and then Mommy just goes to Jerusalem and leaves the babysitter on the floor with a hypodermic in her neck, and we never find out anything else about her. <laughs> she goes to Jerusalem and she meets this holy-looking bloke called Joseph, who helps her find her kid. It turns out that the head of the World Bank is the Antichrist. <laughs> And Joseph leads her to a temple, and she takes the kid inside, and then a helicopter comes up from over the horizon and blows up the temple. Fade to black. A quote comes up from the Bible. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and makes war. End of film. What? <laughs> I mean, the other films are boring, but they make some sense. <laughs> in the summers, we used to come back from abroad to Leeds. You know, live in the tropics, summer in West Yorkshire, as you do. <laughs> and we had a tiny flat, two bedrooms. One bedroom for the parents, one for the four kids. That's two sets of bunk beds. I was left-hand side, top bunk, he-man duvet. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking. And yes, it was awesome for forts. Because <laughs> that's four mattresses, four duvets, four pillows, two permanent structures that if mum was out, all the cushions from the living room. Because I was the eldest and the protector of Greyskull, I was charged with getting the others into bed. Mum would say, time for bed. Classic mum. <laughs> But sometimes she would say, time for wink bed. Only she would wink instead of say the word wink. <laughs> but this is radio. 
Now this would herald what we called, imaginatively, wink nights, which is less creepy than it sounds. <laughs> Basically, on those nights, I would be extra efficient at getting my siblings into bed. Come on, Joe. No, come on, Joe. No, no, go and do your teeth. Why? Why? Why do you have to do what I say? Well, a number of reasons, Joe. Number of reasons. One, I am older than you, so. Mm. <laughs> Two, on your duvet, you've got Star Scream, and he's a baddie, isn't he, Joe? <laughs> yes, that is a niche joke, Joe. <laughs> but it has got a nostalgic ring of truth, hasn't it? So, it's staying in. <laughs> And three, do you remember when we were doing bikes, Joe? We were doing bikes, we were riding our bikes down the long driveway, down the long driveway on House 16, Road 59 in Bangladesh. We were going fast and doing 180s, going fast and doing 180s, and you got confused and drove into the wall. Well, you damaged your brain, do what I say. <laughs> And when I got everyone into bed, I pretended to go to sleep. But I didn't go to sleep. When all was quiet, I would sneak out of bed and me and Mum would watch telly. <laughs> I felt like a flipping spy. <laughs> But we didn't do any of the normal spy stuff, like, you know, using an umbrella or turning a pen into a bomb. We just watched Clive James. <laughs> the next one they made is called Meteor Apocalypse. There is absolutely no need for me to take up any more of your time with that. It is precisely what you now expect that film to be. <laughs> but there is one film in their canon which is different. It's called Sunday School Musical. <laughs> UK release title, Sunday School The Musical. Was it really worth printing an alternate DVD cover? <laughs> now, in this, there is absolutely no apocalypse, which is a shame. <laughs> because after the second song, I was really looking forward to the reign of fire. <laughs> It's very slow and very painful and very, very, very dull. It's got the amount of plot of like a really bad sitcom. Because, oh no, the church is going to be shut down unless we can find $10,000. <laughs> hey, the first prize for this singing competition is $10,000. <laughs> How convenient. <laughs> the dialogue is absolutely mind boggling that they think this is cool. What on GGE is that? GG what? It means God's green earth loser. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's the loser in that transaction. <laughs> At one point, someone seriously says, Psych, this is 2008. <laughs> Ant and Dex stopped that before the millennium. <laughs> I was praying for the rapture. <laughs> When I was still living in Zimbabwe, I broke my leg. It, it was during lunch and we were at the playground. And now, I don't know if you've ever been to a playground in the third world, but if you have, you'll know they're a hell of a lot beefier than our pansy swings. They're made of thick iron bars and spikes and chains. The, I think one of the best times I've ever had was playing on a decommissioned steamroller in the park near our house in Harare. I mean, they painted it pink and that means safe, right? We're on the seesaw, seven of us on each end, going up and down and shouting with glee. And then I fell off and the massive iron bar landed on my leg. Now, if you were a teacher at this school and this had just happened to a child, what would you do? Just think about that for a second. Screaming child, playground injury. You might bring the parents, maybe a doctor. Not this lady, oh no. She carried me into the toilets and washed my leg in the urinal. <laughs> she then sat me in the corner of the classroom for the rest of the afternoon. And then at the end of the day, carried me to my mother. Carried me, I was unable to walk. That should have been a hint, lady. 
When we just moved to Bangladesh, we were staying at the Swedish guest house, and they had a playground. And I was doing this thing where I was swinging on one of the thick iron bars and seeing how far I could jump. And I got pretty good at timing the release, and I, I, I started really nailing the landing. Just then, Mum came out with a new video camera. Perfect. I swung, released, and totally ballsed up. I landed on my arm, breaking it. And Mum's still filming. And we still have this video of her zooming in on me crying and a, a clear voice coming from behind the camera. Stop whining! And then, not very Christian, is it? Much like my teacher in Zimbabwe, she took me inside and just sat me in the corner for the rest of the afternoon. When my dad came home, he said, you know, if he's still crying four hours later, I think he might need a doctor. <laughs> for some reason, mother thinks I'm a hypochondriac. I've never given her any reason to believe this. A few years later, I woke up in the middle of the night, barely able to breathe. I went to their bedroom and tried to explain. But the sentence, I am finding it hard to breathe, is difficult to say if you're telling the truth. <laughs> a few weaselly botched attempts later, Mother said, shut up and go back to bed. <laughs> Turns out it was pneumonia. <laughs> in bed for two weeks. <laughs> Cheers, Mum. I've waited almost two decades to get my own back. Oh, Mum, I'm feeling fine, thanks. Brothers and sisters, let us pray that they make no more of these films. <laughs> Amen. Tom Tuck goes straight to DVD, was written by Tom Tuck and starred Tom Tuck. The band were Fars, Question Mark, Ben, Handysides and Martin White. The producer was Leanne Coop. <laughs> And Tom will be unearthing more gems from the straight-to-DVD market next week. And if you missed the first of Tom Tuck's series, it's over on the Comedy Club on Radio 4 Extra, starting tonight at 10. The News Quiz is back on BBC Radio 4. I don't drink anymore. The last time... I shouldn't confess this, really, but the last time I drank, I woke up with Eamon Holmes. <laughs> well, it was on TV, but nevertheless, it's not worth the risk, is it? <laughs> When you're asked by a doctor, so how much do you drink? Most people who drink a normal amount play it down somewhat. <laughs>